When you're less than 10 months into the first year of your first term as president and your approval rating is already down 20 points from where it started out, and your performance in office has been so abysmally incompetent that you've already managed to create an energy crisis and an inflation crisis and a supply chain crisis and a border security crisis and a botched exit from a foreign war, it can be difficult trying to figure out a political strategy where, whereby you can start to rebuild or just build, as the case may be, your reputation and earn back some of the public goodwill that you've managed to squander during your short time in office. But Joe Biden thinks he has the answer. He thinks he's got a two-pronged strategy for extricating himself from the political wilderness he's blundered himself into. The first prong of that strategy is throwing your vice president under the bus, because amazingly, she's even more intensely unpopular than you are. And the second prong is that Joe Biden is going to prove his woke, tolerant, diverse, leftist bona fides by calling people great Negroes. Now, we talk with some frequency on this program about the fact, which is beyond all argument, that Joe Biden has made more racially offensive statements in public than any U.S. political figure of the last 50 years. And wasn't it just a couple months ago during the hurricane that he casually referred to one of his aides, who is a black guy, as boy? And we all remember the You Ain't Black incident, which is so legendary it's hard to believe it was barely a year ago. And we all remember the 2008 campaign when Biden referred to Barack Obama, his future running mate, as, and I quote, the first African-American candidate who's bright and clean and articulate and looks nice. And there's a delicious irony in that last one, the, the sort of irony that only Joe Biden could author with such deafness and aplomb. And that's probably the first time in history that the name Joe Biden has appeared in the same sentence with the words deafness and aplomb, but I digress. For it seems like the future running mate throwing shade at the future nominee has become something of a tradition in president, presidential campaigns involving Joe Biden, or at least the last two of them, at any rate, his first few runs at the presidency, the first of which I believe was in 1892 when he lost in a nail-biter to Grover Cleveland, were defined more by embarrassing public gaffes, humiliating plagiarism scandals, and crushingly lopsided defeats than they were by any intrigue between future nominee and future running mate, probably because Joe Biden never had the slightest chance of becoming either one. But this is Washington, D.C. we're talking about, and if there is anything we know for sure about our nation's capital, it's that if you can't fail upward there, you can't fail upward anywhere, except maybe Hollywood. So, Joe Biden remained stubbornly alive, and despite being as dull and unexceptional as ever, despite having no life accomplishments of which to speak and no discernible skills or talents in evidence, Eventually, it became his turn, and seemingly within five minutes of his becoming the presumptive Democrat nominee last year, he announces, I'm picking a woman of color to be my running mate. And after an exhaustive nationwide search, his people, well, they came up with a three-woman shortlist. Stacey Abrams, Karen Bass, and Senator Kamala Harris, the Ugandan headhunter, the California cackler, the bimbo of the border. I'll stop there. In other words, if you're Joe Biden and you're trying to settle on your running mate, your choice was down to a softcore porn romance novelist who once lost a governor's race, a dippy, dim-witted senator who basically called you a racist and a segregationist bastard on the debate stage, and an actual honest-to-God communist. And look, while they don't share much of anything in common demographically, as vice presidential nominees and subsequently as vice presidents, it's, not, it's, it's hard not to notice a lot of commonality between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Remember how little we used to see of Joe during his vice presidency? Remember how he disappeared for weeks and months at a time? I recall joking with Lady Curmudgeon during 2009, the first year of the Obama administration, that they probably had Joe locked up in the bathroom in the basement at the Naval Observatory with duct tape over his mouth, with an ankle bracelet that gives him an electric shock if he gets to within six feet of a live microphone. And remember how, on the rare occasions when they did let him speak in public, he would make a complete blithering ass of himself, and that sounds a bit familiar, no? 
Remember how Obama's staffers got so frustrated trying to keep Biden out of his own way that they basically just gave up, threw up their hands, told him he was on his own? Because I'll be damned if that doesn't sound a lot like CNN's reporting from yesterday. And, and that stuff, of course, is all in addition to the elegant synergy, at least I think it's elegant synergy, between Joe in, in 2008 making racially offensive remarks about Obama and Harris on the debate stage in 2020 calling Joe a racist. And my, I, haven't even, I haven't even gotten to the Satchel Page thing yet, and the opening segment has already gotten away from me, so Jim Eagle, get me out of here. From high atop the battlements of Castle Curmudgeon, where you can report to OSHA that we are celebrating 60 straight days with no lost limb accidents, which is really good for us. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America and all ships at sea. Welcome to the program. I am your eponymous host and humble servant. And we need to talk about a great Negro. But don't take my word for it, because it was President Joe Brandon, sorry, Biden, who said it. He didn't mean to say it, of course. He said it because he is a confused, doddering old coot who can't string six words together and has difficulty telling his ass from a hole in the ground, even though the hole in the ground never pooped all over the Pope. The thing he meant to say, when, he, when, he, when the thought popped into that cobweb-filled space that's between his ears and under his hair plugs, he wanted to mention Satchel Page. The thing he meant to say was, I've adopted the attitude of a great pitcher in the Negro Leagues and later in the majors whose name was Satchel Page. And it's it takes less than 20 words to say it. But this is late period Joe Biden, so there's no way it was going to be that easy. By the time he got done mangling whatever was written on the teleprompter beyond any and all recognition, here's what he actually wound up mumbling out, direct quote. I've adopted the attitude of the great Negro at the time, pitcher of the Negro Leagues, who went on to become a great pitcher in the pro in, in Major League Baseball after Jackie Robinson. His name was Satchel Page. That is 39 words. Could have been done in 18. And he winds up calling a guy the great Negro. But you know what? I'm not going to sit here and pretend I think that's a racist statement, and especially not in the pantheon of things that have been said by Joe Biden that really were racially offensive. There's been a weird status quo that's developed in the last 25 to 30 years where in, in American usage, the word Negro is always viewed as a pejorative unless you're talking in the context of Negro League Baseball, in which case it's perfectly fine to use the word as much as one pleases. Does it make sense? Of course it doesn't make sense. Politically correct speech codes never, ever make sense. Now, I'm old enough to remember, and you may be too, a time when older black people only used the word Negro and pointedly refused to, word, to say the word black because it was something they associated with young, radical black power activists. The people who started coming along in the mid-60s insisting that black people should only call themselves black. Black power black pride, black is beautiful, those slogans were all invented to promote the use of the word black as a replacement for the word negro, which the young radicals considered to be, even when it was self-applied by African Americans themselves, something that smacked of the plantation and of obsequiousness to the old order, which it certainly was not by the mid-60s, and a lot of people from the older generation persisted in calling themselves negroes, right up through the 70s and 80s. But as is often the case, when the radical left decides it wants to change the conventions of the English language, they usually wind up winning in the end. And I suppose it's a fitting microcosm of the Joe Biden presidency that he mangled beyond all recognition the thing he was trying to say, and the thing he was trying to say was wrong anyway, even if he had managed to state it coherently because I'm sorry, Joe, Satchel Page was never a great pitcher in the major leagues. He was already well into his 40s when he debuted with the artists formerly known as the Cleveland Indians in 1948, and nobody really knows how well into his 40s he was, since Satchel Page's true date of birth remains one of the hallowed mysteries in baseball history. He pitched parts of five seasons for the Indians and then the St. Louis Browns, mostly as a reliever when relief pitchers weren't really a very big part of the game yet. And while the numbers he posted were perfectly respectable, above average even, and hugely impressive for a man who was probably approaching age 50, it's just not correct 
to say Page was ever a great pitcher in the major leagues. But then, nobody's really quite sure what point Biden was trying to make, even though I think this was the fourth time in the last ten days that he's made some bizarre off-the-wall, out-of-left-field, if you will, reference to Satchel Page, including one time that he said it to the Pope after he had finished defecating all over him, and nobody seems to have any idea what he's trying to get at. But can you imagine if Donald Trump had suffered the same slip of the tongue and inadvertently called someone the Great Negro? Can we even begin to envisage the 72-hour-long paroxysm of pearl-clutching hysteria that would then ensue across the world of fake news performance art? Can you imagine if Donald Trump pointed his finger at a black interviewer and said, If you don't vote for me, then you ain't black. Can you imagine if Donald Trump had done the same bright and clean and articulate and nice-looking riff about Obama that Joe Biden did? In all likelihood, and we all know it, if Trump had said those three things, the Democrats probably would have impeached him three more times. But when Joe says it, who takes the blame? Right-wing media, naturally. And that is a good and proper thing, because when you hear this much blubbering amongst the Washington elite class and the mainstream fake news performance artists about the supposed depredations of the right-wing media, it means that conservative media are over the target and they are making headway that they aren't supposed to make. The mainstream media did not have any intention, for example, of covering the Loudoun County rape scandal in Virginia. And when the story was broken by the Daily Wire, an independent conservative media outlet, they did they did everything they could, the mainstream media, I mean, in the first week to 10 days to bury that story and make it go away. And not just because they were trying to drag Terry McAuliffe across the finish line and make sure that their preferred candidate won the governor's race, but also because they had they had already spent the previous several months building a completely false narrative about angry parents at school board meetings being domestic terrorists, when in fact, in the one case that they had made into the cornerstone, into the linchpin of the entire bullshit narrative, the guy whom they declared a domestic terrorist He was angry at the board meeting because his daughter got raped in the school bathroom by a boy in a dress and the school board was covering it up because it was inconvenient to their desire to trumpet and celebrate their all-gender bathroom policy during Pride Month. The media Democrat complex didn't want to talk about any of this. But the Daily Wire's reporting gained sufficient traction that they had to talk about it They no longer had a choice. They didn't want to talk about critical race theory either. So they simply declared that critical race theory does not exist and is not part of the public school curriculum, except, whoopsie, here comes another annoying conservative media outlet that has the receipts and the emails that prove beyond a shadow of an inkling of a doubt that CRT was explicitly and intentionally inserted into the Virginia public school curriculum over four years ago. And then it was, okay, maybe it does exist. Maybe it is being taught in the schools. But if you've got a problem with that, it's just because you're a filthy white supremacist who doesn't want your kids to learn about slavery. In other words, if we are bad at our jobs, it's because you're a racist. If we get busted trying to bury a story for political reasons, it's because you're a racist. If we get caught red-handed just lying out our ever-loving asses about the facts of a case it's because you're a racist. And also, I'm pretty sure you cause climate change by being a racist also, but the mainstream fake news media do have plenty of good reasons to view the future with trepidation. For the president they propped up throughout the fake campaign of last year, whose carcass they dragged across the finish line with all the weight they could muster, whose every error and misstep they covered for, whose every incoherent utterance they dutifully translate, his approval rating sits in the mid-30s and continues to plummet, which means the fake news performance artists have largely lost their ability to manipulate public opinion, except to the extent that when the mainstream news media says a thing, most people feel like they can just go ahead and assume it's a damned infernal lie because it nearly always is one. Oh, and speaking of damned infernal lies, the January 6th commission is still a thing, apparently. They've been holding hearings that not many people have been paying attention to, but now Adam Schiff is hopping mad. And why is Adam Schiff hopping mad? 
Adam Schiff, who can make a fairly strong claim for being the most brazen, most prolific, most congenital liar in the history of the House of Representatives. Adam Schiff, who remains the only man living whose head appears normal size when he stands in front of a funhouse mirror. Well, he is hopping mad because people are not respecting his authority. And so, for the supposed crime of ignoring a fake subpoena from a fake committee conducting a transparent political witch hunt, Steve Bannon has just become the first American in the last 40 years to be indicted for contempt of Congress. Steve Bannon, who wasn't even employed by the White House on January 6th, who stopped working in the Trump administration all the way back in 2018, who has about as much insight to offer into the events of January 6th as do you or I. Adam Schiff is going to attempt to have him thrown in prison for a maximum of one year for the crime of ignoring a fake subpoena from a fake committee chaired by a man who remains on record as saying hundreds and hundreds of times that there is clear and compelling evidence of Trump-Russia collusion. Even after the Steele dossier has been debunked just about as thoroughly as a thing can be debunked, even after it's been proved beyond any doubt whatsoever that it was a work of fiction authored at the behest and at the expense of the Hillary Clinton campaign and used by a corrupt FBI to obtain fraudulent FISA warrants and conduct illegal surveillance on Donald Trump and his campaign. For over five years now, Adam Schiff has been the public face of the Trump-Russia collusion scam. Has he faced any consequences for it? Any sort of professional recrimination at all? Nope. He is not. Not even a censure vote. Not even a resolution that says... Please try not to lie so much in the future. Even after all that, even after establishing himself as the single most corrupt scumbag narcissist in a city overflowing with corrupt scumbag narcissists, Adam Schiff is still empowered to persecute other people, to ruin their lives, destroy their families, wreck their finances, and for what? Because you're his political enemy. And because he can. Just ask Mike Flynn, because he can tell you all about how that story goes. And speaking of the fake January 6th commission, we might as well close tonight on a comic note, because guess who is being rumored as preparing to make a run for the presidency? Why, it, it is none other than Congresswoman Liz Cheney of Wyoming, who owns an approval rating so abysmally low with her own constituents that Joe Biden, who sits at 38%, and Kamala Harris, who sits at 28%, actually appear popular by comparison, for Liz Cheney is the proud owner of a 19% approval rating with the voters of Wyoming, which, at last count, gives her the distinction of being the only politician in these here United States who is less popular than Nancy Pelosi. So you may find yourself asking, why would such a person even contemplate running for president when their chances of securing the nomination are somewhere between laughably non-existent and hilariously non-existent? And the answer is an exceedingly simple one. People don't launch doomed presidential campaigns because they think they have a chance of winning. They launch doomed presidential campaigns because one... It is a chance to augment their public visibility, and two, it's an excuse to spend 12 delicious months calling people on the phone asking for money. Liz Cheney knows her career in elective politics is over, but she's going to make as much money as she can on her way out the door. If she's the only anti-Trump candidate in the Republican field, that is the only fundraising pitch she needs. I hate Trump. Send me money. And everybody in the donor class who can't stand Trump they will duly scratch her a check. She'll be a fringe candidate. She won't win any delegates. But she'll be able to scrape together enough cash to build herself a nice retirement cabin from which to make her appearances as a CNN analyst, which is the actual job that she's angling for. Meanwhile, on the Democrat side, they find themselves in the unique, possibly unprecedented position of not having the faintest idea who their presidential and vice presidential nominees are going to be in 2024. Because it ain't going to be Joe Biden at the top of the ticket. And it sure as shit ain't going to be Kamala Harris. They are both little more than political cadavers at this point. And in Joe's case, he's also a cadaver in the literal sense of the term. And while there may have been some quaint hope at some point that Kamala Harris could be molded into some sort of competent politician and potential party standard bearer, 
when you've been the vice president for 10 months and you're sitting on 28% approval, there are two inescapable conclusions that can be drawn from that. One, you are really spectacularly bad at your job. And two, people dislike you very intensely. It really takes a lot of doing to be an unpopular vice president. The vice president doesn't even have to do anything to make him or herself unpopular. So this is quite the auspicious achievement on Ms. Harris's part, having 10 points softer approval than the senile president who's called, who calls people great Negroes and leaves a trail of gastrological destruction like a scar across the face of the entire European continent. And that is just about everything I have got for tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I will be back here with you Wednesday. Do have a pleasant tomorrow. Until next time, get off my lawn. <laughs>